governor's order. So members of the public may listen in and um, hear from the board of registrars are Dee Shabazz, Jamie Wagner, Jacqueline Gardner, and Susan Audette. So since we do have a quorum, then the meeting will now come to order. Okay. Um, the first thing on our agenda is the election of a chair. And I am happy to take that um, role. It um, gives me no added responsibility or authority. It's just for um, keeping the order of the meeting. So yeah. I appreciate that, I, Sue, but can we as the Board of Registrars elect a chair? I was just going to say, um, I was gonna continue and say, unless somebody else wants to take that role. So if somebody else does wanna take that role, I suggest that the four of us each put our nominations out as to who we would like to be chair. So I nominate myself, D. So I nominate myself, D. Okay, Jamie. I um, nominate Sue Audette. Okay, and Jacqueline. I um, nominate Sue Audette too. Okay, so the consensus is that I will be the chair. Um, do we have a second? I, I can you second your nomination? I don't know nomination? if you really need a second. I'm just being extra right. cautious. Oh, God, I'm not familiar with the whole. Yeah. Can I ask about process? So that means you don't have any voting power as the chair. Just no, it's no, no. It's just to keep the order and call on people. Um, and so the vote was there an actual vote so we could have it on record? We can. Yeah, we can. Let me just get that. Yep. And uh, excuse me, Sue, I'd just like to remind you that you need to do a roll call vote. Okay. Because we're on, uh, we're remote. Yeah, I appreciate that. I thought that's what that was. So do I, okay. So again, um, voting on who the chair will be for the, for the uh, duration of this meeting. So D Shabazz vote. Um, excuse me, I'm sorry. So, what do you mean um, by that? So yeah, what it would be is um, there was a motion to nominate you. Uh, Dee made a motion to nominate herself. Mm -hmm. um, two others nominated you. So at this point, you would say something like, okay, do I have a motion then to approve uh, oh. to Audette as the clerk for the purposes of this meeting? Okay. And then someone can just say, so moved. And then you would take the roll call vote if there's no further discussion. I see. Okay. I kind of cut the thing in half. I gotcha. Okay. All right. Well, I do have one question though. Is this going to be at every meeting or is this from now on as far as like for you facilitating the meeting? Cause that's what I'm assuming this is for. Facilitate. This is for just this meeting. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Per the agenda. It's just okay. it's had it in the agenda, just this meeting. Okay. All right. All right. So then do I have a motion to approve Susan Audette as chair of this meeting? So moved. Okay. Yes. Okay. And then um, a vote on this motion. Um, we'll start with D. So are, are we, uh, we haven't voted yet. I just, in terms of process. Oh, Hello? Hello? I can hear you. Yeah, I yeah. can hear you. Oh, Everything okay. just froze up on my screen. Sean, are you, can you hear me? We can hear you, but yeah, you did freeze up. Okay. Okay. So I just, as, as you know, the chair, assuming the chair's position, what powers does the chair have specifically with the board of registrars? This is new because we haven't had a chair. So I'd like to know as a member. Madam Clark, would you like me to respond? Yep, I think she's frozen again. She is. Um, the purpose of the chair for, the, for this meeting is to facilitate going through the matters that need to be discussed. And, um, and the chair has the ability to recognize people to speak um, and, you know, kind of takes the votes and, and um, records, it, records the roll call votes. Okay. So, and it's only for this particular meeting. What happens on um, the next meeting on Monday? Yeah, I, I think the clerk's um, intent here is just to address this meeting. Um, and on Monday, if there, um, you know, there could be another vote uh, for a chair of that meeting. In most, in most okay. boards and committees, 
they mm -hmm. they do elect a chair for the you know the entire but i know you guys haven't done that mm -hmm. um and you know it, it's usually probably fine it's just here um you know we need to kind of figure out how to move through this and so um yeah i get it for you know efficiency but um it's just unusual also to have a non-voting uh chair um so i did see something like that in the um in the uh, chat or the Q and A, um, there the board of registrars is comprised of four people, including the town clerk. Mm -hmm. And although yes, she's an ex officio member by virtue of her position, she is a full voting member and has the same rights as every other member of the board. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, I just and nothing personal against Sue, uh, but I just object to. Uh, you know, the town clerk is as the chair. Um, okay, I, I would say, I, I see that, um, you know, we're, we're having minutes of this meeting kept, so we have a record of that. All right, my computer just kicked me out completely and closed yeah. down on me. Sue, let me just bring you up to date. There was a few questions asked, questions about um, whether as an ex officio member, you could be the chair and about what authority there would be in that position for today and also whether this was intended to be a longer um, a point of election to chair just for today. Um, I indicated that my understanding of your intent is that it was just for today and that on Monday, you would all need to readdress this issue. That's right. And the agenda says the same exact thing. It says election of a chair for this meeting only on both agendas for today and Monday. Okay, sorry about that. I was talking and then the computer just died. I've just moved into this office on Friday and there's a few little snags. Everything got moved on me. All right, so where were we at? So we uh, motion to approve was made and um, seconded and now we're on the vote. Okay. Yes, okay, so um, starting again with D. So no, I vote okay. no. Okay, Jacqueline. I vote in favor of us getting a chair and so we can proceed with this meeting. Is that what you mean? Favor of me being the chair. I think that was a motion made. Yeah. Yes, okay. Jamie? I vote to have Sue chair this meeting. Okay. All right. And I assume I have a vote. I nominated myself and I vote yes. Okay, so motion to approve Susan Audet as chair of this meeting today has been passed three to one okay okay all right so the next going, um oh, can i ask one question i don't know going forward can we set another meeting or we need to talk about that separately to nominate a chair of the board mm -hmm. of registrars just as a whole um is that something i can throw out there yeah you know to create another meeting for that just so we we have that going forward. Um, so then yeah. we don't have to do this every meeting. Yes, Sorry, def so definitely. Then. No, that's but okay. I, I actually think um, going forward, we should have some maybe rules of procedure on board, you know, right. in place. So yeah, something for future discussion. Okay. I, can I make a motion? Mm -hmm. I'd like to make a motion that one item uh, be added to the agenda not foreseen prior to the 48 hour uh, posting and ask that uh, attorney John Boniface's letter to the board of registrars be added to the agenda and that he's able to make an oral presentation about the contents of the letter. So we have a motion on the table um we want to vote on this whether to allow it i think i, yeah. I think we as a rule of procedure we have to vote if there's a nomination uh -huh. made uh -huh. um we have to vote on okay. that not mistaken. okay so then um so i made the motion I, yeah you make the motion then i move to um vote on this motion to allow attorney boniface's letter well, Sue, so you need to see if there's a second, and then if there's a second, then you can um, open it for discussion. Oh, okay. Then you can ask for a motion to, you know, to, um, I mean, and then you can allow you to a vote. Oh. Yeah. Okay. Vote. I'll second okay. it. Okay. I'll second it. All right. Mm -hmm. All right. 
Okay, so do we have discussion? Um, yes, at some point in time, I would like to um, give my viewpoint on what happened at that particular meeting on the 21st, okay? That's, okay. Uh -huh. At That's, some point in time. Mm -hmm. And I, I, I agree, Jackie. I think since I was not there, I had a doctor's appointment. Um, I think it would be helpful uh, in hearing uh, Attorney Boniface's letter because it might provide an opportunity for that discussion. I'd appreciate that. Oh, okay. But I think I have a response already in that in my comments. But hey, well, we'll hear it all out. <laughs> hear it all out is what I say. Well, for now, the motion is to uh, whether to allow the letter of Attorney Boniface's, uh, you know, his, his letter uh, mm -hmm. be allowed, added to an agenda item for today, and which was seconded. So any other discussion on this? Would, does his, sorry, I keep switching back and forth on my phone to my email. Does his letter, would it apply more to the meeting on Monday? topic or um i'm just trying to like i said sorry if i keep, i don't know if i keep disappearing or not but i keep trying to go back to his, his letter um i think that if we really oh i'm sorry no i would say i just don't know if it would apply more to today or to monday so the, yeah so the the letter is to you know allow him to speak um about you know, three to five minutes to the, the letter as well. Um, you know, and I, I think this would be helpful pertaining to the second meeting, but particularly to um, procedure right now that we're, we're currently in. Okay, understood. Attorney Goldberg, do you have any um, suggestions or thoughts or, you know, ideas? Certainly. Um, as long as the chair didn't anticipate that this matter might be raised today within the 48 hours, it can be added to the agenda. Um, the uh, question of whether it's more, um, more related to today's discussion or Monday's discussion is certainly something um, to consider. Um, you know, the board has in front of it a particular thing that it needs to accomplish today. Um, and, you know, in, in my view, at least, the open meeting law issue is separate from the issue of, um, of, of the certification, which, you know, and, and the status of the petition, which is what we're dealing with today. Um, it, the other thing, just so that everyone is aware, is that uh, there is no requirement that any other person be allowed to participate other than in the public speak portion of the meeting. So that's up to you. So essentially, that boils down to it's a policy decision of whether you all want to go in that direction today, and if so, um, you know whether you want Mr. Boniface to be able to speak as well. Um, under the open meeting law, you know, again, it's not prohibited if it wasn't anticipated at least 48 hours in advance. Whether to do so is a decision that you all need to make for yourselves. Thank you. Well, I think it's it's kind of misstating. Uh, you know, his his argument in the discussion, it's really about uh, process. And so if I could restate the motion. Okay, go ahead. Allowed. So, yeah, so <laughs> um, I'd like to, again, make a motion to add uh, Attorney Boniface's uh, letter, but to have him present uh, orally about the contents of his letter that he sent to the Board of Registrars uh, on uh, yesterday. So uh, again, it's unforeseen and prior to the 48 hour posting, but I ask that he be able to make an oral presentation about the contents of his letter. Do you have some suggestion as to the length of his oral presentation? Three minutes. Okay. Okay. I'm guessing. I don't know. <laughs> Three to five minutes. I mean. Okay. All right. Just. All right. Um, it's on motions on the floor. Any discussion? I. I guess I would be willing for just a short amount of like the three to five minute range to hear what he had to say, but I'd also like to just make it known that I would like to have him formally present on Monday, if he's just kind of giving his a background of what's going on, if it pertains to the open meeting law and trying to keep these two subjects 
um, separated, I think that um, I would like to see him back on Monday and be speaking on Monday regarding it. Um, but again, if it's, if it's a short amount of time today and he's just giving an overview and then that will give us time to, to think about what he says over the weekend to prepare for Monday, then I'm open to that without much, you know, additional time being taken up so it doesn't kind of muddy what we're trying to accomplish with today's meeting. Okay, thank you, that Jamie. Anybody? Yeah. Any other comments? Jackie? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I just want to reiterate that I would like to respond and I think that my response will also cover his his commentary too. You don't feel um, at this point ready to respond? You want to wait until we get into the... Uh... Oh, oh, let me ask you this. I have a written response here as far as I'm concerned and this is what I was going to discuss. I have no problem as far as like I'm, I'm a terrible typist, which is why it's uh, handwritten, but I guess over the weekend I could have it in writing. Okay, but that's in regard to the, the um, appeal. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, no, the, the motion in front of us right now is to whether to allow Attorney Boniface's yeah. letter and him okay. to speak on this letter today. Okay. Um, it, it, sure, as long as I get a chance to respond to it at some point in time. Okay, whether all right. Say next week or whenever. Okay, so um, then let's, let's, let's take a vote on the motion to um, allow Attorney Boniface to speak to the letter that he submitted yesterday. Um, so D. Yes, I'm in favor. Yeah, since you made it, I know. Well, I'm just being, um, ja yeah. Jamie. Yes. Okay. And Jackie. Yes. Okay. And I also vote. Yes. Susan. Yes. Okay. So motion has been approved. Um, we will allow an additional agenda item of, um, Attorney Boniface's letter received yesterday to be discussed and spoken to by him during okay. the, um, we can add it to the public comment period, I suppose. Is that appropriate, Lauren? Yes? Okay. All right. All right, so let's see, where are we right now? Um, I think that brings us right up to the public comment period. Okay. So can he speak first uh, to just get that? And then uh, it'll be important to hear the public on all sides. Mm -hmm. Do we need to vote on that or can we just... I'm gonna first announce that the public comment period, um, we have set aside 15 minutes. So um, who would ever like to speak, please raise their hands. We will call on you and um, let it be known that um, any opinions spoken during this period are not supported by the Board of Registrars necessarily. Um, they are personal opinions of the person speaking. Okay, so. Um, so do we know a count of how many people are speaking and just to make things fair and balanced? Yeah, that's, that's the next thing I need to get, see how many hands are up right now. Okay. So let's see, I see four, five hands up right now. Um, including John Boniface. So, oh, hands are going up. So one, you know, two, three, the four, thing, five, six, seven, eight. The other thing that's important to add, if you don't mind, is um, yeah. if you're on Zoom and you've dialed in, you press star nine to raise your hand. Thank you, Sean. Technical support, it's always helpful. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I see a phone number, that's right. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. Hands, does that look right, Sean? Yes. Okay. Um, we've allotted 15 minutes. Um, I'm going to, uh, we can push that up a little if that's all right to 20 uh, to give people two minutes to speak. Yes. Does everyone okay with that? Yes. Okay. All right. Yeah. Okay, then we will start um, to begin this public comment section of our meeting by allowing John Bonifaz to speak. I, I can handle that, Sue, if, if you don't yes. mind. When we had that technical blip, I lost my co-host. So if you oh. don't mind, just, sorry. If you don't mind, oh. just right clicking and making me co-host again. I, I will, hold on one second. That. There we go. All set? Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. Thank you, everyone. This is John Bonifaz. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. 
I, I am an Amherst resident, longtime Amherst resident, as well as an attorney with more than 25 years of experience in constitutional and voting rights law. I appreciate the opportunity to speak before the Board of Registrars of Amherst with respect to the contents of the letter that I delivered to the board on May 5th, 2021. This meeting is scheduled for discussion around the appeal the petitioners have filed with respect to the certification of the voter veto petition. And the meeting scheduled on Monday is to discuss the open meeting law complaint the petitioners have filed with respect to the April 21, 2021 meeting. However, there's a critical question before this board as to whether it can in fact make a determination on the appeal of the petitioners today before deciding the open meeting law complaint. Now, attorney Goldberg is here to argue, I'm sure as she has already in writing uh, before the town council uh, and to you, uh, Ms. Audette is town clerk that the ruling of McCarthy v. Secretary of the Commonwealth is binding on this board and that that ruling would prevent this board from having the authority to hear this appeal uh, because in fact it is already engaged in certifying the signatures via the delegation that it made to the town clerk on April 21. But the entire premise of that legal analysis that attorney Goldberg puts forward is based on the claim that the April 21, 2021 meeting was valid and that all actions taken at that meeting were valid. And that can only be determined first by deciding the open meeting law complaint. If the petitioners are correct that the open meeting law was violated on April 21st and that all actions taken on April 21st by the board at that meeting are null and void, then there would be no basis to go forward in deciding this appeal because the board would have to, in the first instance, review the signatures that the petitioners put forward for the voter veto petition. So this is a critical process question. I'm not here today to testify about the contents of the open meeting law complaint. I will do that on Monday at that duly scheduled meeting. I'm here today to make clear that this board cannot proceed with deciding this appeal until it first decides whether the actions it took on April 21st, 2021 were consistent with the open meeting law. And if they were not, those actions were null and void. And therefore the review that the town clerk's office conducted of the signatures is null and void. And, and, and the board needs to start de novo and new in reviewing those signatures. The second part of the letter that I wanna to bring to your attention is a direct and serious conflict in having the town attorney, with all due respect to her, having her advise you on your actions as the Board of Registrars at this meeting. The town attorney has been representing the town council, the town manager, and the town clerk on this matter. The Board of Registrars, charged with overseeing all matters pertaining to elections in the town of Amherst, including local ballot questions, should not be advised by the town attorney whose clients in this matter have interests which are directly adverse to the interest of the petitioners. The Board of Registrars must act independently and with adherence to basic principles of due process as guaranteed by the US Constitution and by the Massachusetts Constitution. I urge this board to retain counsel who does not have such conflicts of interest or at a minimum to contact the Division of Open Government of the Office of the Attorney General of Massachusetts to advise you on your actions today. Thank you. Okay, thank you for your information. All right, um, next hand up on the list is Jeff Lee. 
Thank you, Sue. Uh, yeah, I'm Jeff Lee, a resident of Amherst. And um, I don't understand why much of the town council and its administration have their backs up over the library petition and why petitioners have been met with so much hostility and so many roadblocks. This petition does not have the power to stop the Jones Library expansion. It simply asks that the appropriation for it be put to a townwide vote, which is perfect, a perfectly reasonable request for a project of such size and impact as the Jones Library Plan. The petition was signed by well over 5% of Amherst registered voters and the citizens a right to wonder why so many signatures were rejected and why the tedious task of certification was assigned to an inexperienced assistant assistant clerk who for some reason felt compelled to complete it without help in less than 24 hours when the town charter allows 10 days. The town attorneys may argue that the section of the charter outlining the voter veto petition process does not grant the right to appeal rejected signatures or review the correctness of the invalidations, but neither does the charter prohibit such a sensible action. Dragging out the certification question by putting it to the courts is not in the best interest of the town nor of the petitioners. The only people who will benefit are Amherst's attorneys, KP Law. Amherst citizens look to the Board of Registrars to be unbiased and thorough in guaranteeing that all voters' rights are protected. Please review the rejected signatures, including the more than 85 for which signer affidavits have been submitted and do what is best for Amherst. Thank you. Thank you, Jeff. Next person on the list is Jasna. Is it Re Reggie or Reg? Sorry about the name, but Jasna. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Hi, my name is Josna Reggie. I live on 96 Farview Way and have lived in Amherst for 31 years. I'm disturbed that the petition drive conducted so painstakingly during the pandemic was certified and turned down so quickly and so many valid, sign valid signatures were rejected. I collected petitions in my neighborhood and my house was a collection point for signatures on that voter veto petition. Several of the town residents in my area who signed it had their signatures rejected. They were shocked because they were longtime re residents and registered voters in the town. They went to the additional trouble to fill out affidavits and go and get them notarized. I find it very disturbing that one in five of the nearly 1,100 Amherst voters who signed the petition had their names thrown out. That's it. That's all I wanted to say. Thank you for your consideration. Thank you, Jaza. Okay, uh, next name I see is Maria Kopicki. Thank you. My name is Maria Kopicki. I live in South Amherst. I want to thank the Board of Registrars for convening this hearing. The examination and counting of petition signatures is a very serious business. The petition at issue here in seeking to allow voters the opportunity to express their will is particularly important. Humans are fallible creatures and mistakes are inevitable, particularly in such repetitive and detailed work. The law provides a full 10 days to accomplish the task of petition certification, and yet it appears that a single individual completed the enormous endeavor of reviewing nearly 1,100 signatures and addresses in less than 24 hours. We have gathered abundant evidence that well over 100 registered voters had their signatures rejected in error. We have provided over 80 affidavits from signatories confirming that they signed. We can demonstrate that the signatures are theirs and the addresses are accurate and match voting rolls. Common sense dictates that these be reviewed objectively and errors corrected to achieve an accurate accounting. Failure to correct these mistakes disenfranchises not only the signatories. Wrongly rejecting so many signatures resulted in an inaccurate certification, which in turn denied the entire voting population of Amherst their right to vote on this issue. I implore you to reverse the rejection of erroneously disqualified signatures and certify that this petition easily met its obligations. As members of the Board of Registrars, with your responsibility to oversee and ensure fair and accurate petitions and elections, you 
are the stewards of the voices of the people. Thank you. Thank you, Maria. Next hand is Denise Barbaray. Denise, you'll have to unmute yourself. Okay, now can you hear me? Yes. Okay, my name is Denise Barbaret. I have lived in Amherst since 1987. I have a very distinctive and a very flamboyant signature. I have been very politically active in town. I've been a member of town meetings since 2000. I've been on town boards and a lot of people know my name because of that. Uh, I believe my signature has probably appeared on dozens of petitions signed over the last 20 or 30 years, yet somehow my signature was rejected. I'm not particularly given to conspiracy theories. Uh, I tend to be a reasonable person, but at this point, absent any other particular explanation, about all I, concluded, about all I can conclude at this point is that my signature was rejected due to my activism. And I find that to be deeply disturbing. Thank you. Thank you, Denise. The next hand is Rita Burke. Thank you. Thank you for calling on me. My name is Rita Burke. I've been in Amherst since the 1970s. I am a retired town employee was a 10 year member of town meeting. I submit my voter registration update form annually and have lived at my current address for over 37 years. Quite candidly, I was gobsmacked to learn that my signature on this petition had been disqualified and that I learned of this only because I was one of several petitioners who requested information on those that were. To discover that one person, apparently without any assistance or oversight, had the power to disqualify my signature and those of many others without apparently, as far as I've been able to determine, any just cause pushed, my, pushed me um, beyond confusion and irritation. How could this happen? And, and, and why has the town appeared so reluctant to be as concerned about it as the voters are and should be. Regardless of one's opinion about the Jones Library Project, and there were people who signed the petition who are in favor of that, but they were also in favor of putting the vote about it townwide to voters, that's democracy. But regardless of one's opinion about the Jones Library Project, everyone should be concerned about the flawed process that has occurred. And most importantly, that their voter rights have apparently been suppressed. I remain gobsmacked, irritated, confused, and Amherst can do better than this. Thank you. Thank you, Rita. And the next hand I see is Martha Spiegelman. Martha. Uh, Martha, you have to unmute. We're not hearing you yet, Martha. Can anybody else hear Martha? I no. can't. No. I think Martha, um, I'll give you another minute to try to make this work, but if not, then we'll go to the next person and maybe in the meantime, you can try to figure out what's going on.
Shall we move on? Everybody okay with me calling on the next person? Oh, she says in the okay. chat, she, hello? She says in the chat, she uh, doesn't know how to unmute on the phone. If the instructions can be repeated for Martha, please. Sean? Yes. So it shows Martha is unmuted on the phone, but let me just look. Um, the code on the phone is star six to mute and unmute on the phone. Yeah, she's in the chat. Okay, so is Martha also dialed in to the meeting? Because Martha, let's see. It says I am on phone. Okay. Um, I am phone. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, Martha, if you could just let us know what um, the last the last four digits of the phone number you called in on, then I can unmute the phone line. Want to type your answer, maybe. Uh, 6779, you see that, Sean? No. Yeah, 6779, it's in the chat. She just sent it. Yeah, I don't see that phone in the Q, number. It's in the Q&A, 6779. No, I know she's showing up as just her name on mine here, too. Right. Um, so here, I can... Um, Let's see. Oh, there she is. Why don't I? I'll, I'll post the dial-in information into the um, into the chat, Martha. And if if you want to move on to the next person, then we'll we'll hop back to Martha if that if that'd be appropriate. Will we get Martha connected? Reconnected. Martha. If I could, I'm wondering if she's connected to Zoom on her phone, and if so, if she taps the screen on the bottom left. I corner, see what you're saying. Yes, yeah. yeah there should be a, a, a mute unmute button. Yeah. So Martha does appear unmuted on Zoom. Um, Oh, she just said she, her last four digits are six, seven, nine, nine now. And she is through her phone. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, I don't. Um, so what, what we can do is, Martha, if you want to um, I'll put the instructions on dialing in um, into the, the Q&A. And if you follow those instructions, you should be able to dial in on your phone. I think you're connected. You're probably connected from a cell phone, but you're connected through the Zoom app. And for whatever reason, that's not allowing, not allowing you to speak. If you'd okay, like, so I can do that. So just take me a moment to, I'll paste that in there. I don't know if you want to, Go to the next person, then come back to Martha. Yeah. Or if you want to hold on. Um, why don't we go to the next person in the light of time and then yeah. come right back to Martha? Okay. Okay. All right. So the next person on the list is David Lithgow. I guess I, I withdraw my comment. Okay. All right. Thank you, David. Shauna, we, I, I was, didn't take very long, so should we nah, come back? Yeah, we, we still, yeah I, I still have to pay, find the information and paste it. So okay, okay. I'll move on to the next we'll person. So the next person is caller 7934. And you will need to what do hit we have to star do? six for the person who dialed in. Hit star six on your phone before you can speak. There, there you go. go. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, I'm caller seven nine three four, also known as Martha. 
Spiegelman. Spiegelman. Oh, there she is. Okay. Fantastic. Okay. Okay. Well, my name is Martha Spiegelman. I am a voter of Amherst for at least 35 years. And I only want to ask a question. It's based on my talking to people like Denise Barbarette and Rita Burke and several others who were amazed that they were uh, taken off the petition. I think that the office of the clerk ought to explain to all of the people, maybe 80 or 90 or 100 of them, why they were taken off. What is the reason that voters who have been registered in Amherst as voters at their home address for many, many years were eliminated from the petition? That is my question. And I think that the office of the clerk should explain to each one individually why they were removed from the petition. Thank you. Thank you, Martha. This will be in the discussion part of our meeting. I believe we will be covering that. Okay, next person on the list, um, I see CJ G. Uh, yes, hello, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, this is Carol Gray. Um, thank you for holding this hearing and allowing the public to weigh in. You have very important jobs to keep the voters' uh, voices and votes uh, recorded accurately. And I appreciate that you're hearing this appeal. Uh, it's of great concern that more than 200 signatures were excluded many of whom, we have 89 affidavits so far and counting, many of whom uh, were registered voters and we believe they were wrongly excluded. Of the people who were excluded, uh, 62 were excluded because of signature. So it had an S next to their name. Signatures don't have to be legible to have people allowed to be voters. Um, what should have happened is if there's a signature and it couldn't be read, you then go to the address and you pull the voter registration form and see if the person's signature matches the voter registration form. When we asked the assistant town clerk if she did that, she said, we don't have to do that. But if that's the case, then that means that anyone who has a signature that might be uh, in any way artistic or hard to read is then not allowed to, to sign a petition because they're being disqualified immediately. And it can't be that way. Legally, signatures are, are required to be the individualized uh, stamp essentially of the person, but they don't have to be legible. They, they Legally, they have to match what's on the voter registration forms. And so that 62 people were disqualified because of signatures. And it does not seem that there was the matching done that would have been required to see if these were actually registered voters. Because we, of the affidavits we submitted, 44 were signature disqualifications. So that means we found the people based on their address, we went to them, they said, yes, I'm registered to vote. Yes, it's at this address. And yes, that's my signature. And we've compared their signatures with the affidavits and they match. And so remember that there were only 22 signatures short for this petition to succeed. So that we have 44 signature affidavits shows that there's a problem here and, and that these, it, we have to think of this in terms of voting rights. Essentially, a petition is your vote. And in fact, your signature on this petition is then opening up the referendum to the entire town. So we're actually talking about voting rights for the entire town. But for those 44 people who voted to have a referendum and had it thrown out because their signature couldn't be read easily and no one took the time to cross-reference it with a voter registration form. That really is egregious and it's a form of voter suppression even though I don't say that it was intended that way, I think that's the effect. Um, there were also 162 signatures that were disqualified for address. Um, so of the address ones, we, we've submitted 86, sorry, we've submitted, um, 
uh, there are there are, we've submitted dozens of, of affidavits for addresses, and a lot of the address violations were because of things such as um, missing an apartment number. But but when I um, I spoke to um, I spoke to the Se Secretary of State's office, um, and um, and one of the staffers there, I just asked over the phone. And by the way, anyone can call in and ask for guidance. I asked them if um, if missing an apartment number was grounds for disqualification. They said, no, usually that's not the case. If the signature is matches what's on the voter registration forms and the address is clear, it doesn't matter that they're missing the apartment form and yet the apartment number, and yet more than 24 were disqualified because of apartments. Uh, in terms of the number of affidavits that we have uh, submitted, um, we've submitted 45 for address issues. Um, one of them was from my neighbor. Uh, I. Uh, He's Carol, I'm sorry to interrupt you. I just want to remind you of the time. You're now on four minutes. Okay, I'll finish this with this sentence. Thank you. He has finished, he has lived at his address on Shea Street for 45 years, and yet his signature was disqualified. I would like to say, in terms of the open meeting law violation, um, you have a right to redo that prior hearing. And, and even though at the time the delegation may have seemed like a good idea to some, with the open meeting law violation, if you think that this process was not done justice, if you think that having um, 89 people submit sworn affidavits raises concern for voter rights in our town, we urge you, we plead with you to give integrity to this process because right now many people are very concerned that voting rights have not been respected in our town. We urge you to take another look. You have the right to do so by reholding that hearing, which the attorney general's office told me that is a remedy that's open to towns to rehold the hearing that was done in violation of the open meeting law, which I'll address in more detail on Monday. Rehold that hearing and you can decide to do the certification yourselves to look at the, the evidence that we provided you because you just can't, you just can't minimize the importance of voting rights, and we have think, to have a process. Thank you, Carol. I am going to have to cut you off. We're all right. We're at ten forty nine. I believe we started the question and answer period more than fifteen minutes ago. Um, at this point, I'd like to. Um, were there any other hands that were up originally that I have not called on? Because we're going to do ten people. Does anyone Eight. recall? Adrian Terizzi's name was up in the initially, and I think it was mm -hmm. it went down by by mistake. I think. Oh, she went down again. Oh, oh she's okay. back up again. She keeps going yeah. up and down. Yeah. Um, can we vote on whether we want to allow the public comment session to continue a little longer, or are we finished with it? We've we've exceeded the time allotted. Well, <laughs> you know, um, I think we if we want to vote on it, but I'd like to make a motion on something different in light of what we heard. I, um, I, don't, I don't know, as point of order, I just don't know if, if we need to vote to extend the comment period first and then a, another discussion on um, what we heard, if we should vote first to allow if there are um, a couple more people who'd like to speak. Mm -hmm. I would make a motion, I, I would move that we allow um, Four more minutes or two more people because i think that's what i just saw up there there was two more hands up to allow them to speak um and then maybe d can make her motion after they speak um for what you were going to be not to interrupt you d but just to um maybe let them speak first yeah we're because we're dealing with the public comment we, we need to decide whether we continue or not so you vote so um you move yeah. that we we allow the last two people to speak Okay. Yep, and allow them just two minutes. Okay. And that they should okay. be allowed to speak. Okay, Jackie, two, G two. Okay, we'll continue then with the public comment session. Okay, so the next hand we see is Daniel Denton Thompson. Yep. Hello. Hi. Well, well, I'm a little, I, I'm a little annoyed because I have lived in Amherst all my life, and. When I saw this petition, I signed it. Like I usually, you know, sign everything with my root with my original signature. And when I told my signature was rejected, I found that very weird and saying that I didn't live here. And I lived at this address for almost uh, 14 years with my mom. 
And my mom was a little surprised too because she signed the same petition I did and her uh, signature wasn't rejected. And so my question is why, my mom was a freedom writer. She fought for voting rights and she taught me a lot about voting rights, signing petitions, everything that you can, you know, you stand up and believe for. I did. And now my signature has been rejected because I don't live in Amherst and I've lived in Amherst all my life. I've been, I was born here, you know, via Northampton and I've lived here all my life. I went to school here and I've lived here for almost, I pretty much lived here for like almost 40 years. So I'll be 40 next year. So my whole thing is, you know, if you have people who are overwhelmed and they just have one or two people on or just one person on, hire more people. Or don't take a vacation if you know you're going to have something that's going to be this big and people have objections to it or, you know, or want to have a debate about it or they have a um, petition that they want to sign. Keep the people on. Then you can go on a vacation after the fact. Or then you could do all this other do everything else you need to do, but hire the people that you need to put in because I'm a little annoyed about this. And this is the thing. It's like the people voted everybody in here to pretty much, you know, do their jobs, not cover or, or negate or pass it down to somebody else who doesn't have the experience. So that's all I have to say. Thank you, Daniel. And the last person whose hand I see up is... Tomas Ja. Hi. Uh, yes, this is uh, Marla Jimmy from South Amherst. Um, first of all, I just want to thank the board uh, very much for uh, convening this meeting and planning another meeting on Monday. Uh, I do think this is a very important issue, and I am glad um, that the board is going to pay attention uh, to it and consider it. Um, one thing that was highly concerning to me as I was collecting petition signatures um, was, well, what took place uh, after the, the signatures were processed. There were several elderly individuals who signed uh, the petition papers. Um, one was uh, a gentleman who approached me outside of town hall and asked um, if I was the lady involved in the petition drive and could he sign? And I said, sure, of course. Um, his hand was uh, shaking substantially. I realized he had a very significant tremor um, with the result that uh, his signature was fairly faint, although it was legible to me and the address was legible. Um, and uh, later I found out that his signature was disqualified and I, I suspect it had to do with his faint writing. Um, similarly, there's an elderly couple um, from whom I also uh, accepted signatures um, whose handwriting was also a bit faint or scratchy, uh, you know, very long time residents um, in Amherst. And um, in looking at the disqualification uh, data, they too were disqualified. And so that's at least three elderly people that just I, as one canvasser, um, became aware of um, were disqualified. And, and I, I can't help but think that the process that we was too aggressive um, and that we certainly do not want to negate the voices of the elders in our community um, who, may le who legitimately wanted to sign this petition and express an opinion as to the need for a referendum. And, and, and so again, just um, if we can keep in mind that uh, the, we do have elderly people in the community, there are people who may have uh, slight um, mobility issues, which will then have some effect on their signature and may cause a very slight variation. Um, and uh, I just, I, I would love to see some due diligence applied uh, so that those individuals are not disenfranchised. Thank you very much for all your work. Okay, thank you. All right, um, I do not see any other hands up. Um, is there anything in the Q&A that um, uh, may be a hand? Yeah, Adrian's Teriz Adrian Terizzi's hand keeps going up and down. I don't know if it'd be appropriate to turn on the microphone for her just to see if, if yeah, she wants to see. Would you I like see me to there's, that My hand has been up, yep, yep. Um, okay, let me see, where is she? Thank you. There she is, okay. <laughs> 
Oh, but uh, thank you, and I'm I'm so sorry for the technical glitches at my end. Uh, thank you. My name is Adrian Terizzi, and I'm speaking this morning uh, strictly as myself. This is a, a personal comment. Uh, thank you, Board of Registrars, for holding this meeting. I think I'm going to begin with the premise that we all agree that the work of a democracy is to protect and ensure the vote of a voice of the voter. Uh, I was not involved in this voter veto petition. And for me, it's not a matter of whether I support or oppose the library. For me, it's all about voters' rights, the rights of the citizen to petition our government. And obviously it's been said under our national state and certainly our local Amherst Home Rule Charter that we do have the right to engage in a voter veto petition. So I wanna commend the BOR this morning. You are a local independent body and your process this morning to engage in and to review the process as well as to examine the original petition signatures and the signed, David this, signed affidavits this morning is a work of democracy at work and at its best. So thank you very much for this morning. It is a good morning and um, I wish you good speed. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. All right. Um... Okay, I believe that is everyone. Um, I, I do see one last hand. Hilda Greenbaum has her hand up as well. Oh, okay. Okay, one last. Okay, Hilda. I just want to say that I've lived in this town for 60 years. I have never seen anything like this happen in the town of Amherst, and I am mortified. I am shocked. And I want to know how and why. And I wanted the person who was responsible to be accountable. I'm sorry that Susan was on vacation at the time. I hope that she's not held responsible for this mess. But I think she's a wonderful person for a town clerk. I'm thrilled that she's gotten the job. But I need to know how something like this happened and that it never happens again. I also wanted to know how many people were attending the meeting from the public, if you can let me know that. Sean, does it look like there 20? 29 people Thank attending. You. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Okay. All right. Thank you, Hilda. All right. So um, does that look like everyone has had you, a chance to speak? It looks like David Withgow has his hand up. I don't know if that's again remember if it was before or not. Yeah, I don't see him. I'm not seeing him. Oh. Okay. Um, all right. Well, then if no one else has a comment. Um, yeah, excuse me. So, um, David Lithgow does have his hand up. I can see it on my. Can you see it? Yes. Oh, okay. Okay. There it is. All right. Then last comment, David Lith Lithgow. I, I apologize for taking your more time. I, I'd just like to point out that, you know, I've changed my mind back and forth so many times in this town. You know, originally I was for town meeting. Now I'm for the council manager government. I've been absolutely astounded at how well our representative democratic process has worked. And I've been uh, so impressed by the volunteers and all the committees and their professional work. Uh, you know, a warm fuzzy every time I think about Amherst democracy at work uh, should be an example for Maricopa County. Uh, when I first zoomed into this meeting, uh, I was going to urge that the Board of Registrars just follow the law and not revisit the certification process on the assumption that the certification process was uh, conducted uh, properly. But I have found uh, all of the people who have zoomed in uh, to speak to their affidavits and to testify to the fact that they voted for the petition. While, um, while I'm sorry they signed the petition, I absolutely 100% uh, uh, believe they uh, 
they have the right to their, that opinion and that it should be honored. And I have found it quite persuasive that I have found uh, their testimony quite persuasive. And so I've changed my mind and urge you to revisit. I would like to point out that two of the people on that list that I know personally, when I called them to uh, find out if they had signed the petition based on uh, uh, a fully informed decision about the library renovation project um, and spent an hour with each of them explaining my point of view and then sending them to the uh, February 16th uh, finance committee uh, packet uh, because their concerns were with the financing. You know, after that, uh, they regretted the fact that they had found they had signed a petition. Now, that's anecdotal evidence that some of the people that signed it uh, did not make an informed decision. Uh, but uh, that, uh, you know, notwithstanding that fact, uh, based on what I've heard today from uh, people that did sign it and whose signatures were disqualified, I've changed my mind and think you should revisit it. Uh, thank you. And I'm sorry to take your extra time. That's fine. Thank you, David. All right. Um, now I don't see any more hands and all right. So, um, then we'll move on to the next section. Um, so Sue, I'd like to make a motion. Oh, go ahead, Dee. Okay. So in light of what we just heard with David Lithgow and, and everyone else, but particularly attorney Boniface, I think we, I, I'd like to make the motion is to adjourn this meeting um, and to postpone any discussion of the petitioner's appeal until Monday. I think, yeah, that's that's my motion without, you know, going into further discussion. I think uh, we should I, I move that we adjourn this meeting and postpone any discussion of uh, the petitioner's appeal until Monday's meeting. Um, and then we can uh, you know, address the open meeting law complaint uh, at that point. Okay, is there a second? I don't hear a second, D. Hey. So in light of no second, motion has failed. Is that correct, Lauren? Yes, okay. Okay, well, I'd also like <laughs> to address, um, you know, if it was brought up that there's a, a conflict of interest by attorney Goldberg, um, if you could address uh, this conflict of interest uh, potentially here in terms of you being the attorney for the town, uh, the town council, and the town manager and your presence at this meeting. Um, Madam Chair, if you recall, that is one of the issues that um, we were going to discuss as preliminary matters today and I'm happy to do so now at your discretion. Yes, please do. Um, so thank you for your question. <clears throat> um, I am the town attorney, I work for the town, I represent the town and not any particular entity in the town. The actions that the clerk's office has taken um, are the actions that are being uh, questioned today. I do obviously have great respect for voter rights um, and believe that it's appropriate that if, if people believe that their, their signatures were improperly uh, not counted, that there is an appropriate form for that. And that appropriate form is not at the level of the Board of Registrars. In the McCarthy case, which Mr. Bonifaz referenced earlier, the court makes very clear that there is one discrete function that the Board of Registrars may undertake. And that one discrete function is comparing the name on the petition to the name on the list. Um, the way that this is done uh, in, in Amherst and everywhere is that the, the address is looked up and then the address and the name are compared to, the, to that on the list. If the, um, if the clerk or whoever is doing the certification recognizes um, under the, the specific rules relative to certification that the name can be certified, then it is. If they cannot, then it is not. 
um, there is actually no authorization for the um, Board of Registrars to revisit, I'm, I'm sorry, not to revisit, to review the voter registration cards in connection with this process. There is a process at the state level for state level nomination papers and petitions uh, for a review by the registrars before it goes to the um, State Ballot Law Commission for its review. But there is no similar authority at the state level. Um, you, you know, I'm happy to show you, I, I'm happy to show you the regulations. I'm happy to show you the um, Secretary of State's booklet that says that there's no ability. Um, and with respect yeah. to- I read your memorandum, so I do appreciate you sending that to us. I did read it, uh, but you're not addressing the conflict of advising us as the Board of Registrar, an independent body, the town and advising the town council and the town manager. So, and it, it, it's just a conflict I, I see uh, here at this meeting. Madam Chair. You may continue, yes. Thank you. Um, so, we, the, the law firm of KP Law represents the town mm -hmm. and the board of registrars is a part of the town. While there is uh, statutory um, authority for the creation of such board, it is a board of the town. It's appointed by the town manager and I believe confirmed by the council and every town with a town meeting form of government, it's appointed by um, the board of selectmen. There's a process for appointing. There has to be names sent. I mean, there has to be inquiries, <clears throat> excuse me, sent to uh, the local town committees as well as to the state committee if the town committees don't return. The board of registrars is a town entity and there is no conflict for me to represent the town in this matter. Sounds like you're representing the, the clerk in all, with all due respect and not the board of registrars. So it's a matter, this is a matter of what the board, the board of registrars is to consider independent of uh, the town and of you, attorney Goldberg. Um, Madam Chair, through you. Um, <clears throat> the, the, there, the town includes the board of registrars, mm -hmm. the town includes the town clerk, it includes the town council, it includes the town manager. Representing the board of registrars and the town clerk is not a conflict. It is consistent with the, the towns, um, with the, the um, representation of the town. And there, you know, there just there is no conflict. Just for your information, we represent cities and towns throughout the Commonwealth. I have represented uh, clerks and boards of registrars in elections matters uh, that um, you know executives approve of or don't approve of, and that that has no relevance. So, to your point, that you're representing the clerk as an employee of the town so, and not the board of registrars. Ma'am, I'm sorry, I didn't say that. The clerk is a member of the board of registrars, period, by statute, a full member of the board of registrars. A non-voting member of the board of registrars. Non-voting, I don't know where you got that impression. That is absolutely untrue. I think we just talked about that earlier in this process when no. she was appointed as chair. No, you asked the question of whether she has the right to vote and I said, she absolutely does. There is nothing that says a chair cannot cast a vote on any matter before a board. And you can look at any of the other boards and committees in town, a chair does not lose their right to participate simply because they're acting as chair. Yeah, I just see this matter is different with the board of registrars acting independently. So I'm going to disagree. And I, I want to be on record of disagreeing and objecting to your presence here within the meeting. So on record, yep. yeah. I'd certainly also like to note that this is a public meeting and anyone can attend, including me. Um, I was asked to be here and am here to help guide you all, the Board of Registrars. Um, certainly, if you are asking uh, a question that is, can we revisit these signatures? Then I can answer that. Should you revisit the signatures? I can't answer that. That's a policy decision. Should there be further action taken at the, at the um, superior court level? I can't answer that. That's a policy decision. But what I can tell you 
is that based upon my 20 years of experience with election law and with representing cities and towns, that the Board of Registrars has a single discrete function with respect to certification. Based on the McCarthy case, there's a, um, a, a key to the reasons why a name was not certified. It is not a personal thing. It is not uh, a rejection of someone's uh, residence in Amherst. It's not saying that they have a nice signature or not a nice signature. It's objective criteria intended to avoid this, in my opinion. It's intended to avoid putting the Board of Registrars in a situation where they're required to be handwriting experts and intent experts. There is no ability to do that. And I think, you know, someone pointed out earlier, 1,100 signatures nearly. If that was the case, nothing could ever be certified and move forward or not be certified and not move forward. This is state law. Towns don't have the right to make their own uh, state, their own laws relative to elections. It's very clear in the Home Rule Amendment. Certification is provided under Chapter 53, Section 7, and Chapter uh, 950, CMR 5502, 03, and 04. It, it's not... I'm not here to debate about that. I'm here to share with you my knowledge. Your legal advice, and which we appreciate. And I've read also about the signatures. And as Carol Gray, uh, a member of the public, pointed out, um, some of these signatures were disqualified. And we, from my knowledge, as the Board of Registrars, did not see these signatures. It That decision was made on our behalf, it sounds like from Amber Martin. And again, it's not personal against her, but it does sound like it was a bit rushed. And so I believe okay. as, a board, as a board, we need to revisit it. And that's why I'm making the motion to uh, you know, adjourn this meeting so we could take that up on the Monday meeting. Well, I just, I'd like to point out, and I'm not sure that you're familiar or recall, but every new registrar in town is provided with an authorization form to allow the clerk to certify and to use the signatures. So whether or not that meeting was at issue last Wednesday, and I don't believe that it was, uh, or the Wednesday that things were certified, um, that is irrelevant. And, and in addition, and I think this is extremely, extremely important, um, the, the, the process is meant to allow an, a dispassionate comparison between the names on the list and the names of the petition. There are typically signatures, many of them rejected by, by city and town clerks as they go through this process. And that is why the law says that city and town clerks have to certify no fewer than uh, two fifths percent more than is required by law. This is, this is technical and it's not intended to disfranchise people, but it's also intended to allow government to function. There is an avenue to challenge this and that is in court, in the superior court. The, the, the clerk and the board of registrars have no jurisdiction. And also, I just wanna say one more thing about the complaint and, and it being rushed that the response was provided. As I recall, that, that process was undertaken with due diligence so that the petitions could be released because when they're not certified, they're not able to be released so that they were able to be released and so that the petitioners themselves could decide what action was appropriate to take next. So if, if anything, the, the process was undertaken in the short period of time that it was to facilitate getting that information out to all of the petitioners. Um, and, and so, you know, I also really think it's important to point out that town officials are presumed to have undertaken their, their work in a manner consistent with law. That's the presumption. So it is possible. Do people make mistakes? I'm not saying that there's not mistakes. Um, it's possible, but the place where that is addressed is not at the local level. And um, you know, I, I assume that, um, you know, the, the rules of statutory construction are familiar to many of you, but just in case, I mean, you look at a statute and then you look at a chapter and you say, well, what authority was granted to people in this statute? And was that same authority granted in another statute that addresses nearly the same topic? And the answer is, it matters. And 55B section six addresses the rights 
of candidates appearing on uh, and questions appearing on state ballots. It does not allow municipal uh, review. And as I said, the state's elections <laughs> booklet indicates that very clearly. Um, the McCarthy case makes it very clear. Yeah. What so office. I appreciate that, Attorney Goldberg. But do you agree that April 21st, um, there was a potential violation of the open meeting law? And if so, this is null and void. No, and that means we're, we're able as a board to review the signatures that they should be sure. reviewed in the sure. first instance. Um, through you, Madam Chair, if I can I, respond. Yes, you may. Um, not, no, I do not agree that there was a potential open meeting law violation the Wednesday that the signatures, I mean, the Wednesday that the board met. That's number one. And number two, even if there were, the board has no ability to void its own legal action. The action was taken. There is an ability to go to court to do that and a judge, an independent, third party will make the decisions on whether they agree or disagree with any challenges that are brought forward. And post election testimony or post signing testimony, such as the affidavits can be accepted by the judge. At the local level, there is no process for that. Under state law, there is no process. So again, I, I, I appreciate that uh, so many people are committed to um, you know, making sure that this process was undertaken correctly. And I certainly understand that if um, I had lived in a place for a long time and my signature wasn't certified, that it would be a problem for me. I would be upset. But I also know that it says right on the form that you can print or sign and you need to sign as registered. And the provisions under general laws, chapter 53, section seven, and the regulations make clear what is acceptable to certify and what is not. Again, there is a method for this. It is appropriate to move forward. And as you know, ma'am, I'm an, also an officer of the court. I have an obligation to tell, uh, to, to provide the information that is correct. Um, just because someone might like that information better than someone else doesn't mean that there's a conflict. So I um, do appreciate that, Attorney Goldberg. Um, I think I'm a just as a board of registrar and my fellow board of registrars that, that I know take transparency as seriously as I do, I think it's important that we get advised by the AG's office, the attorney general's office. I have sent a letter to them and um, I'm hoping that they will respond uh, promptly to advise us independently. About what, and, uh, The town's attorney. Of this process, it's about the process. Well, the attorney general doesn't have jurisdiction over anything but the open meeting law. And if you have a complaint under the open meeting law, which I know there was already filed, there's a process for dealing that. And that's why we had it set up on Monday. Um, it, ultimately, uh, you know, the board um, gets to decide how to proceed. Uh, I don't see any reason to delay today. I don't think it's inappropriate in any way. And I don't think any... Uh, hearing on Monday or any meeting on Monday is going to change that. Um, it, in the interim, uh, there were people who filed both complaints that their names were not certified, and there were people that filed complaints that their names were certified, that they didn't want to be included on the petition. And it's under state law, there is neither option available to the, to the Board of Registrars. So the, the, the point of holding this um, meeting today is to make sure that it's compliant with both the spirit and the technical requirements of chapter 55B7, which says you need to meet within four days of the last day um, to file objections. The last day to file objections was Tuesday. Today is the first day that um, possible to meet on this. And so this was the day that the meeting was scheduled for, again, to provide the public the residents, the voters of Amherst, as well as you all, with the information that they need to know to decide how to move forward. So if there's a violation um, with the open meeting law, because it was filed with the open meeting law uh, for the state um, and through the AG's office, then it will be null and void. The attorney general has the power to nullify 
Whether they would is a different question. The, the court also has the power to nullify. You don't have to go to the AG first. Um, but again, that's up to the court. What was undertaken here was a proper process to certify the signatures consistent with the authority that the registrars had already provided to the clerk. Again, the goal was to make sure that people knew that that was happening. That's why there was a meeting. It was not to uh, authorize someone to do something that they wouldn't normally do. It was instead uh, held to provide that notice to the public that that's what was happening. In any event though, it's irrelevant because the board of registrars have each given approval for the use of their name with, reg with certifications. And that's the only way that the clerk's office could get that signature. Um, so I, again, I, I'm not taking issue with the fact that people are upset. I'm not taking issue with the, pack that it, with the fact that it appears that many of the people who you have collected, at, not you, um, that the petitioners have collected affidavits from have raised issues. It's just that the board of registrars can't do anything with it. The petition as certified fails to have the number required to move to the next step. It is not in apparent conformity with law and it cannot be changed by the board at this point. A court has jurisdiction under chapter 56, section 60 of the election laws. Um, and I, I don't know a different way to explain, but I, I feel like the allegation or the suggestion that I would be acting on some sort of interest other than the board's interest is it's, it's offensive to me. Um, I have no personal interest. Everyone who got on the, the, um, the uh, public speak said, I'm a resident of Amherst and I've lived here for X number of years. I'm not a resident of Amherst. The outcome here to me is not the, the point of this discussion. The point of the discussion is what does the law allow you to do? And what should be the next steps for the petitioners if the um, board has no jurisdiction? That, and I, I don't see any conflict in that. I don't see any problem with that. And um, in fact, that's my job. Um, that's my job. No matter what I think personally, I have to report what the law says and then you all get to make a decision. So it's not personal, Attorney Goldberg. So I appreciate that. Um, we, I guess, we're over our hour. So, and I know it was posted for an hour. Um, so I, I move that we um, postpone further discussion of this for the next meeting. Madam Chair, if I may. Yes. Go ahead, Attorney Goldberg. When a meeting is posted, it just needs to be posted the start time. It can continue as long as it takes. There's nothing in the open meeting law that were to acquire this meeting to be further delayed. Thank you, Attorney Goldberg. Um, I just like to point out that I, I appreciate Attorney Goldberg's advice on this and I really felt it was useful in knowing what the law is. We are not lawyers, any one of us. Um, knowing what the law is in, in able to make, um, in order to make an informed decision, I thought was the most important thing here. I didn't want to be basing any decisions on um, incorrect information or incomplete information. And so in that regard, Attorney Goldberg has, has you know, this is her, her role is to, to tell us what we can, cannot do based on what, you know, law, chapter, section, et cetera. Um, yeah, and I appreciate that, Sue. And I know you're, you're been in this position a long time and I, I do appreciate your own experience and knowledge. I'm, I think having an independent, um, you know, uh, independent legal advice would be appropriate for us to remain independent as a board. That's, that's my opinion, obviously, but that's how I think it should function to assure transparency and that the voters are heard on either side. I also want to point out, you know, the reference to the regulations for certification. No, we haven't discussed this, but I've been certifying signatures for 15 years in this office. Um, the the town clerk as the uh, one of the board of registrars and with signature stamp permission for certification from the board of registrars, we've always done the certification of signatures based on the voter list. Obviously, you know, our board of registrars throughout the 15 years has not, they have not been a, 
employees of the town clerk's office, they have not done the certification. It's always fallen on the town clerk's office and staff. And we are given by the Secretary of State a clear set of guidelines and regulations on how to certify. At no time do we, we decide we're not gonna use any of those regulations. Um, there's a whole list of things that we have to go by. Like number one, somebody signs their name at an address. Okay, we look them up according to the voter list, which is in the state um, voter registration system. It's electronic, so that's what we're using it against. Um, there could be two people with the same name at the same address. When someone signs their name, if we can't tell that that's the exact voter who signed their name, they're not gonna get certified. We may be able to read the name and read the address, but if there's two people, again, say there's a junior and a senior and they don't specify junior or senior because there's no date of birth on that form that a person has signed, there's no way to differentiate. So that's just one circumstance in which we would not allow a signature. Um, but again, we're going by a state, uh, um, a document that tells us this is what we're using for certification purposes, nothing else. Everyone is trained in this office in in following these guidelines. Um, yet given more you know, time, and I, I definitely appreciate your experience, yet given more time, the voter rolls could have been pulled to match those signatures, it sounds like. No, that's uh, not part of the regulations. That is not part of the state secretary's uh, regulations on how to certify a name. Um, Attorney Goldberg, do you think it would be useful at this point just to put up the um, regulations for certification? Certainly. Just so that the Board of Registrars can see what we utilize? Yes, let me just get over there. Okay. But again, notwithstanding the fact that Attorney Goldberg has pointed out, and I have that myself, and she can put that up too, the um, Secretary of State's Board of Registrars outline you know, who they are, the appointment and structure, registration, local list, certification of signatures, that it, it says, there is no review process for non-certified signatures on municipal nomination papers or ballot question petitions, as attorney Goldberg has pointed out. So it's a simple, it's, it's not simple, but um, if we don't have any legal authority to do this, to me, that ends the discussion, but I'd like to hear your opinions. So a couple things here. Let's let's go back to the, I just, just to let you know how certification of names happens. Okay, standards. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, Madam Chair. Yes. If I may. Um, actually, we can start right above there um, because if you look, this is um, 950 CMR 5502. And it, it addresses the required actions by the registrars. Mm -hmm. So right here is a reference to the, um, to the need not certify more than two fifths thing that I was talking about earlier. That's in chapter 53, section seven. And in addition, look at number uh, 12, uh, it says the registrars may authorize office, and, uh, I'm sorry, let's look at 11 first. The registrar's failure to require to comply with any requirement of 5502, except for 55027, shall not invalidate their certification. And seven is that the facsimile stamp be used to certify the signatures. So everything that the board that the board did through the town clerk's office is legal and and determined it deter, not debatable about that. Um, and then when we get to the standards. Um, we, we get to um, this process, as, as the clerk was saying, here are the standards. Uh, these standards came about as a result of the McCarthy case where the court basically said it's impossible for anyone who wants to challenge the actions of the, um, of the uh, registrars or clerk in certifying names to guess why they were certified or weren't certified, et cetera. And so there's these reasons. If the name isn't certified, the reason has to be listed. Um, perhaps even more um, important though, is uh, if we get to a name is not certified substantially as registered, it says the address is different, even if only the house number is different or if a post office box number rather than the street address appears. So that is the instruction from the state. And again, it, it's not gonna result in a 
perfect uh, determination of everyone who is a registered voter in town. It's looking to give the clerk's office and the registrars in some towns to be able to make decisions based on objective information. The other thing is, um, and if Madam Clerk, if you would indulge me, um, if I can go over to the um, to the actual uh, O'Brien case, I mean, sorry, the McCarthy case for one moment. Sure, go ahead. Thank you. the wrong page. Sorry about this. Okay. Um, let's see, I know I sent that. So um, just give me one more second again, I apologize. So of course, this is assuming that uh, the open meeting law, um, that there's not a violation. So I appreciate you being very explicit with this attorney Goldberg. Um, I know I sent it earlier. Let me just double check. Uh, I'd rather have you see the exact words. Okay. I have to stop sharing for one second so I can switch back over. It's in a different program. In this case, um, and thank you for that comment. Um, in this case, which was decided in 1977, in the beginning of 1977, um, the court was looking at um, a situation where a candidate uh, did not, um, if you look, the the statute afforded independent candidates full, adequate, and speedily. Uh oh. Lauren, you froze. Okay. Well, we'll just hold off here while Attorney Goldberg. Uh... Gets her computer working again. Ah. Ah, okay. Okay, am I back? <laughs> You're back. Okay. So I'm going to resume this. Oh, it's not there. Okay, I can get it in another place. This is my, um, my internet. So attorney Goldberg, the, um, the many affidavits that were submitted uh, from my understanding, um, certifying that these signatures and that these folks are residents, et cetera, um, are we to review these affidavits at any point as a board? And Ms. Shabazz, I feel like that's a, that's a very important question and it's, it feels like you should be able to. But at this point where the board has acted, the McCarthy case specifically says, as does the secretary's booklet, as does state law, that there is no appeal from a local, from the decisions of the registrars, except for the decision of a court under chapter 56, section 60. Quote unquote, post election testimony is uh, very allowed in a very limited manner. Uh, one, because it can be used to intimidate and one, because it can be used um, to try and, and change people's um, positions. And so a court has the ability to request post-election testimony about, um, about the intent of the signer, about uh, you know, what the, the decision was that the, um, that the registrars made. The court gets to look at it anew. So Again, the, the affidavits, they're important. And I, I, I certainly understand that anyone that signed an affidavit has a reason to be concerned that their name wasn't certified. But nevertheless, the way the law works, there is one way to challenge that. And that is at the superior court level. Um, the, the language I was gonna read you from McCarthy um, and my connection to my system at uh, work just dropped out. But essentially what it says is that um, uh, the Board of Registrars, yeah, um, 
it says the there's specifically one role for the board of registrars at the local at the local level. It says in general, uh, I'm sorry. It says once that the board has done its job with respect to register um, certification, it is performed and they have no continuing duty. The court concludes that in general, the board is barred from reversing their positions on particular signatures after they have refused once to certify them. And the case goes on to say section, and this is specifically with what has been referred to as uh, or referenced as the, the clerk's office not doing due diligence. Section seven does not contemplate, that's chapter 53, section seven, that the registrars will make any independent investigation and this court has held that they are precluded to do so. What is contemplated by the statute is a simple comparison between the two documents. And that's it. And again, it's not, I mean, if the law- Yeah, it just legal, sounds like the, it just sounds like what you presented here is that the McCarthy ruling does not necessarily involve this situation where the original uh, certification of signatures could be declared null and void. Um, again, what, you know, based on a serious open meeting law um, violation. So I hear what you're saying, but it doesn't sound like the McCarthy uh, ruling actually applies in that case. Madam Chair, Madam Chair, for you, I, I feel, I mean, I keep, I keep saying this, but I think it's important for me to say again, chapter 53, section seven, and it's implementing regulations specifically authorize the Board of Registrars to delegate certification uh, responsibilities to the town clerk's office. In fact, each of you have done that. When you became a member of the board, you signed a piece of paper that said that the clerk's office has authority to do that. That is 100% consistent with probably, you know, 90% of the towns in this commonwealth. It is unusual for registrars to go through that process because they have to understand how to use the state system, they have to be familiar with the regulations, and then they have to make um, a decision on that and, and explain it. So again, it, the open meeting law issue in my mind is a red herring at best. Um, the meeting on that Wednesday was intended to provide information to the public because there was a want or a, a, um, an intent to be transparent. Uh, that is the reason for the meeting. It did not give or take away any particular authority. The registrars had that authority. And when I was showing you the 950 CMR 5502, um, I believe it was uh, the last section, it said, the registrar's work shall not be undone by any non-compliance with the above, except if the facsimile stamp wasn't used to certify, meaning someone has to attest that that process was undertaken. So whether there was a particular vote, it says uh, in, this, in the regs, it says again, by, um, by vote or otherwise. And, and you know, I, I- It sounds like it's your opinion, whether it's a red herring or not, as you call it. Um, I think having an independent um, voice, uh, legal voice in this matter through the AG's office and the open meeting law um, compliance at the state level would be helpful uh, for me I as can, a board of registrar. I can tell you that um, they, they will only handle it in accordance with state law. There's an objection filed. The board has 14 business days to um, con to acknowledge receipt and act on that complaint, um, and then notify the attorney general of the same. And uh, especially where there's an ongoing matter, I can't imagine they would be willing to kind of jump into the fray before following the normal procedure. I don't speak for them, but in my experience, they don't give out advisory opinions on things like this. Um, so again, if we're looking at this as a, just just the facts, take away any outcomes, take away what any of these decisions will mean. The law allows the registrars to certify, I mean, it allows the registrars to authorize the clerk to certify. That happened here when the registrars were um, appointed in accordance with the, you know, the proper process and to be kind of extra um, transparent, the board held that meeting to make sure that 
uh, there was, you know, something on the record about it to make to be even more transparent. Mm -hmm. So, um, Sue, are we able to ask for independent legal um, guidance in this matter? Um, I think we need it as a board. Uh -huh. I'd oh. have to look into that, Dee, because this has never happened before, so I don't know. Mm -hmm. no. I don't know. Can I, can I just say one thing? When yes, I was like looking at 5502, that was the one that said um, the registers may authorize the office of employees of a city or town clerk's office, including the city or town clerk, to perform all duties required by um, 950 CMR 5502. And this authorization may be accomplished by, among other things, a vote of the board of our registers. In my opinion, on the 421 meeting, that's part of what we were doing then. Which I wasn't okay. at. I, okay. So. Okay. But I'm just saying that because like in the agenda, the mm -hmm. agenda made no mention of any petitions. It said, and I forgot why that now. On the agenda, when it talks about the delegation of authority and the duties under the Amish uh, rule charter sections 82, 83, and 84 to town clerk staff. And that's what I thought that the meeting was about on the 21st. And I just elaborated on it with a, a bunch of pages. And then I talked a lot about the stuff in um, 950 uh, CMR 55502. Yeah, That's Jackie, I, I, right. Yeah. And I, I don't think we're disputing that we have the power to delegate authority yes, to okay. town and, clerk's yeah. office. That's uh -huh. not the I, issue. Yeah. yeah. Uh -huh. but like it's, whether that we, part, it's whether the board, it's whether the board complied with the open meeting law. Is, I, is what's I, at issue. I understand that. And I also think that they comply by the open meeting law by looking at the rules and the regulations in the open meeting law too. Well, from my understanding of the emails mm -hmm. I received, mm -hmm. it wasn't clear that the meeting would um, have you all uh, discuss the petition. Okay, that but that's what I'm saying. That was never brought up about the petition in that particular meeting. That should have been something separate or whatever, because again, they still had that time window for it to um, for it, for it to be processed during that time too. And may I step in? Um, I think Attorney Goldberg has made it clear that um, irregardless of the night or the 421 meeting giving the town clerk's office permission, mm -hmm. that was icing yeah. on the cake, so to speak. That was right. um, in the interest of being transparent and. Mm -hmm. um, it really was unnecessary because we already have permission to right. certify signatures and use facsimile right. stamps. It, right. it was a it was a layer on a layer. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I see it that way. But again, at that meeting, nobody mentioned anything about petitions, and people could have called in on the Zoom line if, for, for public comment, and nobody commented on it. Yeah, I so. Again, I see it as a uh, we need guidance on a violation okay. of the okay. open meeting law. Oh, no. Yeah. Jamie, do you have anything to add to this? Um, other than, I mean, we are full aware of what was happening on the April 21st meeting, turning over the authority to the town clerk's office to handle um, these situations. And I feel as though, you know, there was time for public comment. Nobody was on. Um, I also feel that me, you know, from my position, I felt that, you know, it was better handled by the town clerk's office having had, um, you know, they've been familiar with this stuff. They've, they've done this stuff before. So um, for them to be able to handle it just made, made the most sense um, in that matter. And I, I mean, I, looking at um, the complaint for the open meeting law, I, I mean, I guess I'm unclear as to why. Um, I mean, it references in you know the the agenda what was being discussed. So I mean, it was it was out there, and I'm I'm just not clear on where the um, open meeting law violation comes in. But obviously, that will come up on on Monday's call. Um, but I feel as though we were acting and had acted in in accordance with what was expected of us. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, I think you all acted with uh, the information that you had, but the public, um, they didn't know what the meeting uh, was about from, from my reading of the open meeting law complaint. So that was not clear. 
All right, I think we should I, table and go back to um, th what we're here for, the discussion of the appeal and objection, um, if, if you don't mind. So that we get, it's quarter 12, so that we can stay on task here. Um, in light of what Attorney Goldberg has brought to the table on what our rights are, as far as the Board of Registrars, what our legal responsibilities are, what we can and cannot do based on the law, do you think we're ready to come to some kind of vote not in my opinion. Not in your opinion? Okay. I think we need further advice, independent uh, legal advice. Okay. Um, Jackie? I'd like to have a little more time to meditate on some of this stuff because I'm still, my head is uh, swimming right now because again, what I had in mind as far as like for intentions, what's going on. I also have to take into consideration some of the stuff that the people were saying today. Um, I'd like to know a little bit more about how the process was actually executed because um, for the most part, I just had a feeling um, what was gonna happen would be that the, um, uh, the board of registers would, would be on the vote, voting process, but seeing as that never got to that part, part, we didn't have to certify it. I'm, can, you, can you explain a little bit further? I'm not quite sure what you're saying okay. about. Yeah. Okay, um, after, um, I guess the signatures had been certified or whatever, um, or I, I, in fact, I don't even really know if the whole whole um, process actually was certified. I know something got rubber stamped, but I don't even know what it was. I'll be honest with that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm just sort of like at a loss and I'd like to see, have more information about what happened, what actually happened. Because again, my expectations at the meeting were totally different from what other people had to Okay. Because again, nothing was mentioned in that meeting about petitions and people are mad about the open, that not being an open meeting law. But, um, and again, the way I see it too, the agenda, and I had asked about that as far as like, that's the only agenda that you have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was it. Mm -hmm. Okay, that's on the open meeting law. Okay. Mm -hmm. and, yeah. And Jamie, oh, do you? Sorry, I'm confused. Um, I mean, again, I know there was an email that went out that, that spelled out specifically what um, we were discussing on April 21st. And I, I mean, I'm going to stick to, I feel like, um, you know, we, we shifted that role over to the town employees. I fully trust that they followed, uh, you know, what the letter of the law is, what says, you know, how to certify and decertify. A signature. I do feel that um, they're more qualified to do that than we are. I mean, obviously, I, I think about you know, I'd like to, I'd like to know the process and and see this person's signature and see why it was this you know disqualified. I guess I, I would like to see that, but I, I feel that um, if we follow that same letter of the law, we're going to come to the same conclusion that the town employee who was certifying came to if you're following that um but I also I also feel like we we pass that over to them for their responsibility um I believe that they have no nothing to gain or lose by certifying or not certifying somebody I mean there's no personal um interest I would I wouldn't imagine from from the person doing the certification but I feel like we turn that that role over to them and I I'll stick to the decisions that that were made um and i feel like you know we kind of were if you're acting in accordance with the law that that there's no reason why you know we wouldn't get the same, okay, the same outcome that, that they got but we're all still talking about the open meeting law thing again i want to go back to our rights as a board of registrars as a group of people in making a decision as to whether to put a name back or not and it's very clear in the law that we do not have the authority Right. Again, there's no review process for non-certified signatures on municipal nomination papers or ballot question petitions. It's mm -hmm. the law. Right, Sue. And, you know, I appreciate what Jamie is saying. I, too, don't feel that any of this was, like, politically motivated. I'm not trying to imply that. I'm trying to, just so it's clear, um, you know, discuss that in the first case, there was a violation of the open meeting law because the agenda on April 21st was not advertised. 
as such that this is this was the discussion. I was not even clear as a board of registrar because I had received an email to say that it was about passing uh, powers on to uh, the, the town clerk. And then it was it uh, said that we were going to discuss the petitions. And then I received a second email at that point to say, oh, no, that was a mistake. Um, it is about uh, giving the, the powers of board of registrars to the, the clerk. So again, I had a physical that had been scheduled out a year. I have a heart issue, so it's important that I attend my physical. And so being that that was not advertised as such to discuss petition um, and signatures, um, I didn't see it as uh, a reason at that point to cancel my doctor's appointment. So it was unclear, unclearly stated to us as the board of registrars, and it was unclearly stated to the public. Therefore, it is a violation. As I see it, they have a legitimate complaint. I'm not ruling on the, the, the issue because I can't, but I feel that the complaint is legitimate and that we should simply postpone this discussion for Monday and, you know, call this meeting. Do we have a second? Is that a motion? You're still moving to D? Yes. Oh, I can make a motion. Yes. So I move <laughs> to, um, yes, I'm, I move to postpone this discussion for Monday. Um, uh, the 21st. 21st. I'm sorry. No. <laughs> I moved to a postpone this, this discussion for it's the 11th, right? Right. I, uh, yes. No. Okay. My, yes. okay. Ten, I can ten, look at my ten. calendar. Yes. Ten. I know it's Monday, Monday, the 10th. Um, and to end this meeting. Do we have a second? Madam Chair. Oh, yes, yes, Attorney Goldberg. I just want to just to say a few things about the open meeting law so that we're clear. Um, if you're continuing this meeting to Monday, you need to continue to a specific time, date, and place, which can be Zoom. Number two, that um, item would have to be added to the agenda. It's not on the agenda now. So it would be something that had been raised in the last 48 hours, I guess, that, um, that the town didn't anticipate or the chair didn't anticipate. I'm not sure whether that's appropriate or not, especially based on the concerns for compliance with the law. Um, you know, that's why there was notice given about the Monday meeting. So, you know, in theory, um, you know, it, there, should, there should at least be some consideration of whether you all think that discussion of this issue was not um, reasonably anticipated at the time that the meeting notice was posted. Jamie, I can't hear you. Oh, sorry, no, I was talking to my son who was coming over here. Okay. Okay. Um, one thought is we could, if, if people want to, if you all agree, if we want to postpone this, um, we can reset a date and we can cancel Monday's meeting and do it another day. So can you repeat that, Attorney Goldberg, why legally we are not able to uh, continue this discussion until Monday? Oh, I didn't say you couldn't continue it until Monday. Um, Madam Chair, through you, sorry, I, I apologize. Mm -hmm. um, under the open meeting law, <clears throat> excuse me, you need to have at least 48 weekdays hour, weekday hours notice of a particular matter to be discussed. And Obviously, there's not 48 weekday hours between now and Monday. I think it was at 10. Is that correct? But Monday is at 2.30. I'm sorry. Isn't on the agenda for Monday the discussion it's, of the open meeting law? That's the only thing on the agenda for Monday, but we still haven't resolved today's uh, item. Well, again, um, until the open meeting law question is resolved, in my opinion, this could all be null and void. As uh, Attorney Bonifaz at the start of this um, had discussed. Attorney Goldberg, do you have any? Um, it, again, I don't 
in my view, uh, based on the law and the regulations and my experience with election law um, in general, I, I don't see that there's um, any issue and, and with the open meeting law, under the open meeting law, I practice municipal law. I have done so for 20 years. I give advice on the open meeting law all the time. Um, the reason for me raising the issue, of course, is that I don't want there to then be a complaint that Monday's meeting wasn't held in accordance with law. So the, the ability to add something to an agenda after the 48 hours uh, posting period has um, you know, been entered is, is dependent upon whether the chair may reasonably, and in this case, the board may reasonably have in, um, anticipated that this discussion of whether the board has jurisdiction over um, over complaints and uh, complaints to remove and complaints to add um, okay. is is anticipated. I, and again, okay. I, that's, I can't I can't make that decision. I just yeah. don't want to, to stumble on something that is more procedural in nature. Yeah, I I agree. I see what you're saying now. So thank you for explaining that. So we proceed with our Monday meeting, which is a discussion of the open meeting law, but we can postpone this discussion and set a later date. That's kind of what I was saying. Okay, can't, sorry. Can't put this just, on Monday's agenda because we're got it. past the 48 hour time. I just line. need some explanation sometimes. Mm -hmm, Thank mm -hmm. you. All right, well, um, then I guess the motion on the table, D, was um, for everybody to postpone this meeting today to a later date and time specific. Um, we would have to pick a date and time. I know we were throwing out some dates the other day for Monday's yeah. meeting. Um, what did I? I hadn't heard from Jamie. So I have um, next week, 13th or the 14th would work for me. Okay. The yeah, the 13th would work for me. And the That's fine with, fine with me as well. Okay. The 13th and 14th will work for me too. Okay. All right. So um, why don't we say then today's meeting will be adjourned until May 13th um, at 10 a.m.? Okay. Sound okay? Yeah. Via Zoom? Yeah. Okay. All right. Um, do we have a second of that motion? I second that motion. Okay. okay. All in favor, we'll do roll call. Um, I am in favor. I am in favor, Jamie Wagner. Okay. I'm in favor, Jacqueline Gardner. Okay. Aye. Okay. I'm in favor. Anonymous. Okay, all in favor. All right. Uh, I, think, I think as this concludes our business for today, Attorney Goldberg, unless there's anything else, um, we can adjourn the meeting. Yes, I believe there's nothing else on the agenda for today. Okay. All right. All right. Then all in favor of adjourning? Aye. 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 Okay. Today's meeting has been adjourned. Thank you. 12, 12 o'clock. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.